Okay, it looks like it's top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Um, just a couple quick, quick things before we get started. You can use your chat function throughout the webinar to send in any questions you might have and we'll try to get to those at the end of the webinar. And the certificates for the U.S. attendees will be available on your account by logging in this Friday. And I'd like to hand it over to Severine to go ahead and introduce our wonderful speakers today. Thank you, Kim. Across the world, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected all aspects of our lives and breastfeeding is no exception. Our responses to the pandemic have significantly impacted maternal and neonatal clinical practices, including breastfeeding support services for pregnant women and mothers, which in turn result in disrupted breastfeeding behaviors. As the pandemic stroke, Medela has set up a series of webinars for healthcare professionals dedicated to share up-to-date information and the latest evidence so breastfeeding is preserved. Today's webinar is to review the conclusions from the evidence accumulated until now about breastfeeding and COVID-19 and what learnings from this evidence can be applied to clinical practice around breastfeeding. I have the immense pleasure to introduce the two presenters of today's session. First, Dr. Nania Scherer Hernandez, who is the Director of Global Education and Training at Medela in Switzerland. Dr. Scherer Hernandez has background in molecular biology and virology and has been in charge of the education function in the medical device industry for many years. Lately, her education focus has been on evidence-based lactation care practices, acknowledging own mother's milk as a medical intervention in the NICU. The second speaker is Dr. Leon Mitoulas from Australia, who is the head of medical research at Medela. With background on molecular sciences and specifically on lipids in human milk, Leon is responsible today for building the breastfeeding research portfolio at Medela. At present, Leon and his team are focused on understanding more about milk synthesis and removal, both by the infant and the breast pump, as well as exploring milk composition and the benefits to the infant. Leon, Nania, the floor is yours. Thank you, Severin, um, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, wonderful to be able to talk to you all today about a a topic that Severin has uh, has outlined uh, that's very important to all of us, and it's something that uh, really motivated us to understand more uh, about the impact that COVID-19 uh, has had on breastfeeding, human milk, and even uh, maternity and human milk services. But one thing we we did notice uh, is that uh, as this year has progressed, uh, we've seen just the impact that COVID-19 has had on all of us. And I think it's pretty safe to say that, you know, at, at this time last year, very few of us would have anticipated that we would have had the 2020 uh, that we actually had. And so the impact on our, you know, our work uh, and the way we live has been profound. And what we've also seen is a significant impact on, you know, breastfeeding and human lactation uh, as well. And that's an area that is is dear to our hearts as it is yours. And it's an area that we also noticed that you know, as, as quickly as the virus was, was spreading around the world, so too was this uh, wave of misinformation or sometimes even just a lack of information that relied on people either filling the gaps uh, of that information or really trying to scramble to try and understand better what was happening. And that's really what motivated us to, to have a look through the literature to try and see if we could pull out the key elements uh, of the evidence to, to really understand it and cut down and, and cut through the misinformation so that we would have a, a stronger sense of, of what was going on, what was happening and what needed to be done. And uh, that article that we wrote uh, is available in Frontiers and Paediatrics. Uh, I encourage you all to, to go and have a look at it. The, the web address uh, is also there on the screen for you uh, at the moment as well. But what we'll try and do is summarise through some of the key um, findings that we had in that article uh, through the rest of this presentation. 
and it'll be myself and 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 Nanya. We'll we'll go through the presentation and, and we'll switch backwards and forwards a couple of times as we as we progress. So a good place to start um, for me always is is at the starting point. So uh, next slide, please. And that's looking at the virus itself. And the uh, COVID-19 or uh, disease is caused by a SARS-CoV-2 virus. And there's some unique elements associated with SARS-CoV-2, which I think also help us in understanding where some of this misinformation comes from or the genesis of it. Um, some details with SARS is that it's a, a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. That in itself is not entirely unique. Uh, there's a, a about a third of all viruses tend to be in this have their genetic material packaged in the same way. The interesting I think for us is that that positive sense RNA effectively acts like messenger RNA. So once that virus infects a cell, that genetic material is quickly and easily read uh, by our own cells um, mechanic, uh, mechanics. Uh, and or quickly translated as well. I think other elements here that you're probably very familiar with by now as well is the, the spike uh, protein and hemagglutinin. These are uh, responsible to help the virus, you know, find the, the cell and to get into the cell to when it's uh, infecting the cell. And other areas that you may have come across in your reading also are the N protein and the uh, envelope or the E protein. They're often used or sometimes used to identify uh, the virus by um, RT-PCR techniques. So that gives us a, a quick sense of what we're dealing with. And if we have a look at the next slide, and, and again, this is an area that you're all very familiar with, and that's basically how this virus moves from person to person and being primarily through contact droplets, airborne, uh, getting into the airways. And then you can see this is where the, the virus uh, in its techniques of you know, getting into the cell using that spike protein, getting absorbed into the cell. Once it's in the cell, it harnesses the cell's um, mechanics in order to replicate, and then it sheds. Uh, you go through that shedding phase where it then moves out of that infected cell and then uh, replicates itself and keeps on infecting other, other cells as it goes on. And so I think in the very early stages, one of the areas that um, may have done us a bit of a disservice is that we saw some of the symptoms associated in the mild cases of this disease, and they were somewhat similar to influenza. And then there was a, a little bit of an overlap in belief that that's how that they, um, in that they were similar, but they're actually quite different. They come from different virus families. Uh, and so there's really not much of a similarity there. Uh, and that got us into a, a little bit of trouble up front. Um, but when it comes to understanding what this disease is like, if we have a look at the next slide, but what we could also have done in the early stages, and, and some did, is uh, the coronaviruses themselves aren't new uh, and that we've had some experience with them in the past, in particular if we look at SARS and MERS. And they all work in a similar manner, but they have their idiosyncrasies and their, and their, and their differences. But what was really interesting is that when we went back and, and looked through the literature, and this was also published recently as well by, by Schwartz, uh, there was no evidence of mother to child transmission, congenital, intrapartum, postnatal, with either SARS or MERS. So really, if you look at it from that perspective, then if you say, well, if you, if you stay in the, in the coronavirus uh, lineage, then the evidence was actually really in our favor in a way in that there, there was not going to be, uh, hopefully, um, SARS-CoV-2 showing any vertical transmission. Uh, so, but then it was really important to investigate that and understand that and just see, well, are there differences in that regard? But when we looked at the, the main policy making uh, organisations in those early stages, some took, you know, may have taken this into account. For example, if we look at the WHO, they said from the very, very beginning, and they were very resolute and they were also um, uh, quite consistent in their messaging, where uh, they were talking very clearly about keeping mum and baby together, promoting and protecting breastfeeding. In the early stages, however, some of the other main or peak policy bodies as well, they, they sometimes differed. 
And so the CDC very early on, they they mentioned separation, but they very quickly uh, shifted uh, into a keep mum and baby together and, and make it a, a co-decision making process. Um, whereas the AAP in the very early stages, that they, they did very clearly say they were um, very prudent in their advice and to, to keep mum and baby separate. Uh, but they did also, as new evidence came in, uh, they did change uh, their policy and their guidelines. But what that, the effect that that had on on ourselves, uh, you know, in the industry, in the area, healthcare professionals, mums themselves, is that it created you know a lot of confusion. Uh, there was a decent amount of fear associated with that as well. And then we saw like tremendous impacts and pressures on the healthcare system. And those pressures came from multiple areas. I mean, you're probably all very, very familiar with the pressure associated with that, where we could see, you know, healthcare professionals being furloughed, for example, or we could see resources being redirected from maybe from one area in uh, in a hospital into a, a COVID-facing area. Or we could see actual um, uh, budgets being cut, for example. And so that pressure on the healthcare system combined with the fear and the confusion associated with COVID-19 really disrupted maternity and clinical practice uh, around breastfeeding, human lactation and breastfeeding support. Um, next slide. And the reason this is very important to us is that that period of time when just after delivery, mums in hospital uh, starting to initiate lactation, that period of time is really critical uh, in, in women, uh, more so than in other mammal model, mammalian models, for example, where parturition actually signals the introduction or the, the onset of copious milk production. In women, there's a delay, there's a, there's a lag of a, of a few days. And so this, this period of time, this one to three day period of time is super critical when it comes to initiating lactation. And that happens to be the exact time frame here that in this COVID situation, this, the most impact uh, was made. And so we look at things, you know, you know, the golden hour, that first hour after delivery of, of making sure that you get baby to breast and you start getting, you know, that stimulus of, um, of the baby feeding at the breast. We're looking then afterwards that that you know that oh, frequent um, and you know frequent uh, breastfeeding, or even for the mother whose baby might be in the NICU, that frequent milk expression uh, and milk removal early and often. These are all things that we know are associated with success when it comes to um, lactogenesis stage two or secretory activation, and we know that the impact of that period of time can be really profound. And so mothers who have delayed secretory activation, we, we also recognise in the literature shows this quite clearly that they're at a significantly greater risk of dropping out uh, uh, as time goes on. And so they don't breastfeed for as long uh, or as effectively. And so mums have a really, uh, I, I suppose the, the, the fear that you know they won't be able to you know achieve and make those lactation goals that they may have set out uh, prior to delivery, uh, and all of these things were happening at probably the exact worst time when it comes to the establishment of their lactation. The next slide. And so for us, that we could see those things happening in real time, and you could see them as well. You could see things like increased separation of mum and baby in that early phase. And we saw that both in maternity hospital and we, in maternity wards rather, and also in the NICU. We also saw a decrease in the support being offered to those women in those uh, wards as well, uh, because there were less staff present, for example. There's less bedside support. Uh, we also saw restricted partner access and accelerated discharge. So when you combine all these things together, we started to, to see really strong negative trends when it, you know, all the things that we know help promote lactation and the initiation uh, of milk synthesis. We saw a lot of them being taken away uh, and that was quite detrimental um, 
And a lot of that was being taken away because there, there wasn't a strong narrative on how to set uh, that scene and the evidence really in order to support and protect and promote uh, breastfeeding in those environments uh, wasn't strong enough, it wasn't there, uh, and, and it wasn't uniform enough. And so if we go to the next slide, the impact that that had was that whilst initially you saw a very strong willingness from mums to provide their breast milk and to breastfeed their kids, what we started to see was uh, that um, willingness being chipped away and that significant portions of mums were, were changing their plans. And that could have been as high as you know one in five women, for example, in the in the French data uh, that we saw, where um, mums were deciding to either not breastfeed or to breastfeed less or to stop breastfeed uh, or feeding their own milk to their babies because of the coronavirus. And you can see even in the in the US, this number was you know pretty close to the one in five um, uh, mark as well. Uh, and across the board, we averaged out at fourteen percent, is what we noticed in the literature. So there was a significant impact uh, from the coronavirus, not just in our daily lives, but it, in, it started to manifest itself in the breastfeeding, the lactation world, because it was impacting right at the exact wrong time. And it was really taking its toll um, on mum's uh, anxieties and behaviours and our healthcare uh, practices. So why the fear? As Leon said, fear of infection, that was one of the very big things. And um, in, when, when you think about infection, I'd like to just quickly go through the modes of, of transmission of the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the primary mode of, of transmission we know is this horizontal transmission. And these transmission routes are actually quite well accepted and, and, and well characterized already. Uh, but I'll just quickly uh, go through them, as I mentioned. We have the, the droplet-borne uh, route that uh, Leon talked about as well. Uh, here we have the, these uh, either medium or large respiratory droplets that are expelled when uh, we are talking or coughing or, or sneezing. And this route, of course, is, is quite, uh, has quite a short range. Then we have the airborne route, and here the, the difference with the droplet transmission is basically the size of the particles, because we're talking about uh, what are called uh, aerosols or droplet nuclei, and these are smaller than five micrometers in, in diameter. And because of this, because they're much smaller, they can remain, of course, in, in the air for longer periods of time and can be transmitted uh, also across uh, lar greater distances um, than the droplet-borne transmission. And then uh, there's the, the third horizontal route, which is this uh, fomite route in which there's basically it's indirect transmission that happens through the cont contaminated um, inanimate objects or, or surfaces. Uh, and we know from the research uh, by uh, Van Doren Malen and his colleagues uh, who actually used large inoculi and saw that the virus could remain viable on surfaces such as, as cardboard and plastic and stainless steel for up to 72 hours. Okay, so that in terms of, of horizontal transmission. Now, uh, in terms of, of vertical transmission, uh, we have really up to date reports of uh, both intrauterine and um, intrapartum transmission. Uh, this has been described, but the cases in the literature are are quite limited. Um, it has been reported for both the term and the preterm infant, and it seems that uh, that COVID for uh, for neonates that is is the, the the infection is not very common. Okay, and it's almost never symptomatic. And from uh, the literature, looks like uh, the the rate of infection is not really greater when the baby is born. Uh, uh, vaginally or the baby is breastfed or it's allowed contact with the mother. For the, um, the case of the postnatal uh, vertical transmission, what we need to, to look at what needs to be examined is really the role that human milk might play if it plays any role at all. Okay.
Now, um, there have been indeed reports of detection of, of, the, of, of the virus in breast milk, but all these evaluations have been uh, done collecting samples in different ways and handling uh, and storing the samples differently and carrying out different assays uh, to detect the virus. So I'd like to take a bit of a closer look into a couple of these publications. In this one, uh, Gross and collaborators, they are from uh, Ulm in Germany, and they examined uh, milk from two nursing mothers that were infected with, with COVID. And if you look at the figure here, after admission and delivery, um, there were four samples from mother one that tested negative. Okay, but the milk of mother two tested positive at day 10, at day 12, and at day 13. While the samples taken after that, if you, uh, if you see after that, those three red, uh, four red bottles, sorry, there's white bottles that are negative because the samples taken after that were negative. Now we have positive samples for mother two and, and, and all negative samples for mother one. What does this mean now? Does it mean that half of the mums are going to have positive samples. So if we look at the study done by Chambers and collaborators they're, they're in California, uh, they analyzed milk samples from 18 mothers. Here you see on, on, on the left side, the numbers one to 18, those are 18 mothers. And the line that you see at, at time point zero is when they these moms tested positive for COVID-19. And as you see here, the milk samples were collected before and after the COVID test, and some samples were collected when moms were uh, asymptomatic. These are the, the, the boxes that are not filled, and the dark boxes were, are the samples that were collected when moms were symptomatic. So we have quite a range of, 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 of different uh, samples. Now, um, when they tested these milk samples, we had one mother that had one positive sample. Okay, so and it was one not just one mother out of 18, but one sample out of 64 samples uh, in total that tested positive. Now, other researchers have uh, also shown that these positive milk samples are, are, are transient. Um, and because of this, it has been difficult to, to rule out contamination of the milk for, uh, for example, uh, via respiratory droplets from, from the mother who could have like, coughed uh, over the sample or something like that. So this could be a possible explanation for these positive uh, breast milk samples found. But we're talking about these positive samples, these uh, intermittently positive milk samples. But what is a positive milk sample? What does it actually mean and how, how is the sample tested? So the assay that is, that is made, and Leon mentioned it uh, shortly before, is an RTQ-PCR. This is a quantitative reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. And it's an assay that is used when the starting material to be detected is RNA, because remember, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 genome consists of RNA. So this RNA first has to be transcribed into a complementary DNA, and this is done using the reverse transcriptase enzyme. And then this complementary DNA is used as the template for the quantitative PCR reaction. So what happens here is that parts of this DNA are amplified using specific primers. Um, you see here on the on the diagram on the left uh, that there are the, the, the primers are these uh, are, are shown by the arrows there. And we have primers to amplify fragments of the N gene, that's the nucleocapsid protein that Leon also showed. Um, and these are used as a screening assay. And the amplification of the open reading frame 1B fragments. Uh, that's the yellow uh, uh, open reading frame on the on the genome. Uh, these are used as confirmatory assays. So basically the answer to the question, what is a positive milk sample is, it is a sample that has been tested positive for the presence of viral RNA fragments. Now, the important thing to remember here is that these RNA fragments do not necessarily have to be part of an active virus, okay? So then, can the virus be transmitted by breastfeeding? Or actually, the question we are asking is, are those RNA fragments, which have been detected in milk, part of a replication comp competent virus or not? So Chambers and colleagues took their 64 um, milk samples, including the one that tested 
positive for the presence of, of the viral RNA and use them in uh, a validated viral infection and, and replication assay that, uh, that they had established that they knew worked for human milk. And this is an assay using cell cultures. So in short, what they did is um, they added the milk samples to cell cultures. They incubated the cell cultures for four days. And then the cell cultures, cultures were tested uh, for active replication, uh, replicating virus by looking on the one hand for cytopathic effects in them and also by checking um, the viral RNA presence using RTQPCR. There was no active virus found in any of the samples, including the one that had tested positive for viral RNA. Okay, so this is for me really important because when one looks at the titles of, 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 of some of the publications, one might have, have the impression that there is actually virus in the milk. And as I said, the, what, what comes from uh, the results of these Q, uh, Q, uh, the, sorry, RT, QPCRs is just that there's at least pieces of RNA there, but they don't have to be part. It could be a denatured virus. It could be parts of a virus. It doesn't have to be part necessarily of an active replication competent virus. So uh, these uh, assays done by chambers are really important in that they tell us that even when they have found um, these RNA fragments, there is no um, replication competent virus that can cause infection that is present in milk. Another thing that was also tested by different um, researchers, especially when it, they started seeing, okay, there's, there's viral RNA present, uh, it could be that there's virus there. If there would be virus in the milk, can we uh, get rid of it somehow? So it was really the, um, the effect of pasteurization on SARS-CoV in human milk. Again, SARS-CoV-2 active virus has not been found in milk samples. So what was done is that active virus was artificially added to milk samples, and then these samples were pasteurized and tested in these viral replication assays. So indeed, holder pasteurization um, is able to inactivate the replication competent uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, that had been added to, uh, to the milk. And that's for sure good to know that if there are any concerns about viral contamination of milk, the milk can still be used if it is pasteurized. So can we talk about viral transmission uh, in SARS-CoV-2 via breast milk? So up to date, there is no evidence of active replication competent virus in the milk of mothers uh, who have or have had uh, COVID-19. And again, if the virus would get into the milk by contamination, for example, via respiratory droplets, um, it can be inactivated with holder pasteurization, which is a widely used method, okay? Nadia. So whilst we know what isn't uh, in the milk, uh, we started to see some literature appear telling us what was in the milk, and this is in, this is quite interesting. This data was looking at specific protection uh, that the milk can provide. And so we saw some research coming up from the uh, research groups in the US uh, as well as in Europe uh, and also in China, and you can see more of it now ar arriving in the literature as well. In particular, looking at the antibody. Um, antibodies in human milk and their ability to protect the infant via um, neutralization of the, uh, of, the, of the virus. So if we have a look at the next slide. So what all of these studies have shown, and I've just picked one out, this, uh, this is an actual image from uh, Fox in the uh, recent iScience article that they published just, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, is that there is a real robust immunological response to the virus. Uh, through human milk. And what's happening is, or is speculated to be happening, is that so the, the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue and the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, that's the malt and the, and the gold, uh, that's the stimulation of the, of the B cell stimulation is from the virus itself. 
we're seeing the B cells then transmitting to the directly to the mammary gland, uh, IgA in particular, and secretory antibody. And so what they found uh, is a really elegant, really nice study. And it's been replicated by a lot of other, like I said, those other studies that you that I showed earlier, and there's more coming out now, are showing a, a really strong IgA spike specific uh, signal uh, in, in human milk. And that spike specific signal is really targeted towards the receptor binding domain, uh, mostly uh, in on the virus. And that's really significant because that's actually where you're going to stop the virus from entering into the host cell. And we're seeing that through both uh, IgA, secretory IgA, and also uh, IgG uh, as well. So if we have a look at the next slide, just a quick look at some of the data in that this is actually quite striking in that the milk from COVID-19 recovered donors had a really strong IgA um, reactivity against the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. So that's in panel A, and you can see there that the red bar there is significantly greater than the negative controls, which come from pre-COVID milk. Likewise, secretory antibody in general, you saw a similar response, as with uh, IgG. Uh, the IgM response was also in the right direction, but it wasn't significant. You'll notice that that p-value is, is 0.07, but it's certainly trending and, and in the right direction. So we have that situation um, where, if we look at the uh, next slide, to, to follow on from what Nanya was talking about, is that there is no evidence of active replication competent virus in the milk. But what there is evidence of is neutralizing antibodies in human milk. And this is quite stark. And so for us, when you know we were talking about it, it was that maybe it's not vertical transmission that we need to be talking about on a, from a negative perspective, maybe it's vertical protection that we need to be talking about. And that comes back to some of that earlier evidence uh, and advice rather that we were receiving, which was to protect and promote breastfeeding. And this is one area that is that, that shows very clearly where the benefits of human milk come from, and in particular in this circumstance where we've got vulnerable kids uh, on the other end, that we can you can see the value in protecting and promoting um, the uh, lactation and breastfeeding. So that is very much uh, we spent a lot of time rather up until now talking a lot about the the biochemistry the molecular biology of the virus and its impact um, in, in lactation, and as well as how the mammary gland responds uh, from a, a biochemical and immunological perspective. I think we, we need to bring it a little bit uh, closer to home in a way and, and have a little bit more look at what does this mean from a clinical perspective uh, when we look at the, the virus per se, as well as our management of it. And I just want to pivot just to look at the clinical side a bit more at the moment. But in particular, I want to focus on, a, on an area that is often uh, not focused on. And this was actually a, a quote uh, provided to us by a, a good friend and colleague in, in Italy, Professor Riccardo Davanzo. And Riccardo, as you would have remembered uh, being in, in, in Italy, uh, they were the the starting point in Europe, the epicenter in Europe. And so they were extremely hard hit. And we um, benefited from their learning experience to a large degree. And it was quite striking when we asked Ricardo one of the some of the key messages or take homes or, or things that he, he, he learned over that time. And this was a direct quote from him where he talked about the loneliness, stress and the depression or anxiety of the mother is a problem that we should address. And that sort of comes back to that fear aspect that we spoke about at the top of the talk. Uh, and this is an area that we could that we also saw. Uh, next slide, please, Nanya. Where we could see that, that maternal stress was being amplified during this period of time. Um, you know, birthing plans were going out the window. Mums uh, were giving birth without the support of their partner. There was this fear of infection that they were just surrounded by all the time because of all this misinformation. Uh, we noticed in the things that we spoke about earlier about the reduction in staff, the reduction in support. Again, that just breeds that fear of in uh, because there's a there's a vacuum of information, uh, credible information going to these women. 
we could also see that there was you know the, the physical distancing and all of the 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 whole situation, all the PPE that they were required to be in and around uh, was just creating stress. And another one, the final bullet point there is one that, that pops up uh, again and again, but sometimes it's really overlooked. And that is the all day, every day, you know, concerns about daily life, you know, the and in particular financial concerns due to loss of income at, due to uh, various lockdowns. Italy had a uh, quite a, a harsh lockdown. Uh, we did also here in um, in Australia, uh, in Victoria, for those of you uh, who are familiar with what happened over here. So in the literature, this started to manifest itself and we started to see more uh, research coming out in the literature that was really starting to document uh, this maternal stress. And so in the UK, for example, 71% of mums reported, you know, poor mental health, feeling low, irritable. We saw data coming out of the US that showed that you know, the COVID-19 situation created additional stress during the hospital stay. And there was a really telling study that came out of Belgium where we saw, uh, you know, where they documented rather 50% of mums experiencing symptoms of depression or anxiety during the lockdown in Belgium. And that was, you know, when you put that together, Similar to the you know what we spoke about before about those things impacting you know that very vulnerable stage of the initiation of lactation, we've now got stress impacting a very vulnerable stage of, of mum's lactation, and that is her confidence and and you know self efficacy. We know once you impact those areas, it's a steep and slippery slope, and a, you know a quick exit from the from breastfeeding and from lactation, and so it's really important to address these these areas and to you know, arrest that decline, arrest that slope to try and keep uh, mum's confidence up to, to keep providing her with, you know, strong and consistent and evidence-based information uh, as well to, to address in particular these, uh, the, this maternal, this aspect of maternal stress. But it's also important to do that as well and then look at all the other clinical uh, implications associated with their, their care uh, whilst they're um, under your care or in your hands. Okay, so we know that up to the moment, no studies have, have shown uh, breast milk to really be the cause of infection from mum to baby. And moreover, the studies suggest that mums who have or, or have had uh, COVID-19 produce milk that provides the baby some form of protection against the virus, as Leon just, uh, just showed. And we also know that the measures taken in, in response to the pandemic are having a, a hidden impact on, on breastfeeding that goes beyond just COVID-positive mothers. It, it, it affects all of the mothers. So knowing what we know now, what can we do? And this review article um, by Chima and colleagues has very clear uh, key points. It, first, that um, breast milk does not appear to play a significant role in the transmission of, of, of SARS-CoV-2. Second, that um, mum and infant separation has a negative health, uh, uh, negative health uh, uh, consequences and, and has also negative emotional consequences. And, and third, that uh, mothers with suspected of confirmed um, COVID-19 can directly breastfeed with appropriate um, precautions. Because given the, the overall safety of, of breast milk and both the short-term and, and the long-term nutritional and immunological and developmental advantages that, that breast milk actually confers, uh, babies should be breastfed. Um, this is a figure um, from the Chima review that summarizes very nicely what to do when the mum is symptomatic or, or has mild sim symptoms, meaning she's well enough to breastfeed. And these are also part uh, of the recommendations of, of major organizations. Now, Leon, Leon mentioned that as well, the, the WHO, the CDC, uh, the AAP uh, as well. Uh, and uh, what 
what's take home message here is basically mums should be practicing the, the three Ws, you know, wearing a mask, washing their, their hands and, and wiping surfaces frequently. Um, here they recommend that mums uh, clean their breasts with soap and water before um, breastfeeding and that mothers and babies uh, really room in keeping the, the two meter distance uh, with the mum from mum and baby uh, and, and maybe a curtain when at, they're not um, we're not feeding. Okay. The other figure uh, also from the Chima review that summarizes what to do when the mother is unable um, to breastfeed because she has either moderate or severe um, COVID-19 just tells us that the mother can express her milk with a double electric hospital grade breast pump, that the milk should be stored in dedicated fridges or freezers and the baby can be fed express breast milk by a healthy caregiver then, okay? So, Basically, keep mom and baby together and avoid the horizontal uh, routes of transmission. We, we know that healthcare care professionals play a role in a mother's breastfeeding journey by supporting them uh, immediately after birth to start initiating an adequate um, milk supply. And they continue to play a role with ongoing support through the early days that constitute this critical window for the initiation and the establishment of lactation that Leon um, mentioned a while ago. So in order to protect and promote breastfeeding during these uh, first 24 hours in the hospital, it is important that mums and babies are kept together. We know that placing the infant skin to skin directly after birth is best practice to encourage that uh, that first breastfeed within within the first hour, uh, which promotes a longer uh, breastfeeding relationship. And as we mentioned before, the latest guidelines from the CDC and the AAP recommend that all mothers, even those um, with COVID-19, um, should stay together with their babies, ideally rooming in and just uh, take appropriate precautions to minimize the risk of infection. Also, due to the measures taken in response to the pandemic, we know that the personnel resources in, in the hospitals are limited. So it makes sense to focus the limited resources on monitoring uh, the mothers that may need more support, mothers with lactation risk factors, so that if the baby is not able to breastfeed effectively or is not able to breastfeed at all, these mums can get initiation support with a double electric grade pump with initiation technology. So what are the, the some of these risk factors that warrant monitoring? We have uh, primiparity, you know, first time being a first time mum, age over 30, obesity, BMI, um, body mass index over 30, and also emergency C-sections. Why do these mums need to be monitored? It's simply because we know from research that women in these um, categories tend to have delayed secretory activation, meaning that their milk comes in after 72 hours. Okay, So in turn, we also know that mothers whose milk comes in after 72 hours uh, hours are 60% more likely to stop breastfeeding at four weeks. Hence the importance of ensuring that the breasts of these mothers are stimulated early, frequently and effectively, be it by the baby or by a pump if the baby cannot do this. And what happens when um, the mother is, is discharged uh, home, especially now that, that the discharge home is happening? earlier. It is important that mums know uh, what they should be doing and what should be happening. They need to know about um, frequent and effective breast stimulation and the importance that this has to initiate and build milk supply appropriately. And they also need to know that if the baby is not able to do this effectively or at all, they will need a hospital grade pump uh, with initiation technology to do so, so that they have adequate milk volumes for their baby in the long term. Of course, this also means that they need to have access uh, to such a pump or have access to the information on, on where to get one. 
in apart from giving moms advice on continuing breastfeeding, healthcare professionals need to direct moms to supporting resources that moms will have available um, once they are home. Because appropriate information and support to really bring about a seamless um, transition from a hospital to home can make an enormous difference in that mother's lactation experience. So let us go back to the title of today's webinar. It was breastfeeding, human milk, and COVID-19. What does the evidence say? So what does the evidence say? And to answer that question, I'd like to quote um, Jada Wright Nickel on something that she said during one of the COVID and breastfeeding roundtables that we have um, organized and carried out in the past months. Now, more than ever, is the time to give breast milk to babies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nania and Leon, for that great information. Um, we do have some questions coming in. We will go ahead and get to those. Um, during the question and answer session, please feel free to submit your questions to the chat function and we'll try to get to those with the remaining time we have left. The first question I have is, would using holder pasteurization for donor breast milk eliminate antibodies that are present also? Um, I'll take that one. <laughs> You'll take it. <laughs> uh, and you can uh, you can jump in as well, Nani. The the one paper that I know of that's actually looked at to, looked at that is um, the Dutch uh, research, Van Coolen. Van Coolen, and, yeah. Yeah, Van Coolen, and they explored two different pasteurization techniques. And what they found with holder pasteurization and also another technique called high pressure pasteurization, they found that both. Uh, both techniques, they could identify the IgA antibodies after pasteurization, but only with the high pressure pasteurization did they find a neutralizing capacity. So there, there might be a difference uh, in the techniques uh, and it does need to be, let's say, confirmed or, or um, confirmed by uh, other parties, other researchers. But at the moment, there would look to be that the IGA seems to survive the pasteurization, but there might be a decrease in the neutralizing abilities. Nanya, did you have anything? No, it was it was basically that when you're using thermal methods, apparently um, the neutralization capacity is is diminished. Diminished. Yep. Okay. The next question is: Do stress, depression, and anxiety affect the quality of breast milk? Sorry, Rip, can, uh, can you say that one again? Can I cut out a bit? Do stress, depression, and anxiety affect the quality of breast milk? I would say no uh, at this point in time. I would need to go back and have a look at the literature. Um, we The composition of milk is quite robust. And what we've seen in the literature over many, many years is even in, in periods of, of very high stress, uh, so in you know conflict zones uh, or even in, in the face of natural disasters, um, mothers are able to produce uh, good quantities of milk uh, and, and the milk of, uh, of a similar um, composition. We tend to maybe try not to use the word quality in a way in that because the, the milk is always tailored to what the infant needs. So the evidence would suggest that there, there's, a, there's a level of robustness in milk composition uh, that is not easy to, uh, to change. Okay, the next question is, why should you wipe off the breast of Coben COVID infected mothers prior to nursing? 
So I think the idea of that is basically behind the fact that mothers could have coughed all over themselves. So it didn't, depending on, 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 on how symptomatic they are and how how much uh, coughing is, is going on. I've had a couple of friends who, when I had them on the phone, you couldn't talk to them. They were basically just coughing. And, and, and I get that. Then, then you can have these, these droplets all over the place. So I believe that that's uh, uh, basically where that, uh, that comes from, because otherwise we, we, we never um, recommend that. Okay. And there's also a question, is there any evidence that mothers should wash their breasts before breastfeeding? I would say that goes a bit into that same uh, that same direction. It's it's if the mother is uh, has you know has COVID nineteen and uh, is is coughing a lot, then then I would say yes. Otherwise, um, we normally say no. Okay. Well, Ian, is there anything yeah. else you'd like to add? No. Nope. Okay. The next question is, when a COVID positive mother pumps, should the milk storage container be cleaned with a disinfectant? You mean on the outside? Um, it doesn't say specifically. So let's just say either inside or outside. Yeah, I, I think it goes along the same lines as, as the, the previous question uh, in that the contact droplets and, and Nan, you spoke as well in the in the talk as to how long these droplets can survive on surfaces, be it plastic or stainless steel or the common surfaces that we find uh, within a, a hospital environment. And so the idea that if you've got a mum who is either uh, COVID positive, COVID-19 positive, um, or suspected uh, of being positive, then the prudent way, and I, and I think that some of this data was uh, also published um, uh, previously as well in JHL, is to make sure uh, that you have, you know, the containers are clean uh, on the outside and that they're, they're recycled and reprocessed um, very carefully. I think also if you go to the literature, the, the data that, uh, or the paper that, that Nanya quoted uh, as well, the Chima uh, and colleagues uh, in the US, uh, they call out very much about keeping the COVID positive um, milk uh, in a dedicated freezer. And I think that is primarily for that potential of outward uh, contamination into, into other milks uh, also. So I would say that uh, a level of prudence is required um, because of the contact droplet uh, ability to to stick and, and stay on surfaces over a period of time. Nanya? Yes, I, I, I believe that's uh, it, because in principle, those mothers are um, recommended when when they are pumping, they, they have to wash their hands before uh, they are, are wearing a mask. So we're really trying to contain that uh, level of fomite transmission. Um, but there's there's that recommendation. And there was a there was quite a, a thing in the literature, remember, with that um, Marinelli paper uh, mm -hmm. about cleaning the, the bottles on the outside, uh, where one had to be really careful what, what kind of disinfectant one uses if one actually does that, uh, make sure that it, it's, it's an appropriate one and not something uh, super harsh or, or that is not um, uh, for food, um, food grade uh, stuff. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more questions coming in. So, Nani, if you want to go to the next slide. We would like to invite you to take a look at a brand new dedicated web page that is for healthcare professionals. The deal is launching today, actually, on our global impact of COVID on breastfeeding. And we'll, um, I know that the um, website link is on the screen right now, but we'll go ahead and email this link out to everyone so you don't have to write it down. But it contains a lot of resources such as evidence reviewed in today's um, webinar, important facts and figures from research, and educational materials for, for professionals. 
I'd also like to um, let everyone know that registration is also open currently on medilaeducation.com for our December 10th webinar, as well as our December 16th webinar. So you can visit there today and register for both of those. And the certificates for our U.S. attendees will be available by logging into your account this Friday. And again, we want to thank everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Thank you, Leon and Nania, for presenting this great information for everyone. And I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.